today at Ditch Digger CEO, we're, we're welcoming my, my friend Stefan. Uh, Stefan is an amazing entrepreneur and uh, great, great culture guy, um, great history, right? From coming from another country um, to be here and, and build business here. All the things he's done is it's, it's an amazing story of, uh, of passion, success, and, and everything else. We're going to hear it here today, QQ. So I'm excited. Yeah, I'm really excited too. So, so Stefan, welcome, buddy. Welcome to Ditch Digger CEO. Thank you. We are excited to have you, man. So am I. It's great. It's and, great. Uh, I've listened to some of your podcasts. Very interesting. Oh, have it good. Uh huh. It is what's interesting? Is it the is it Gary or um, is it the, the <laughs> well <laughs> the guest more you than me? Q. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Gary. I he's he always has lots to say. Yeah. <laughs> So always interesting, not, yeah, and I mean he's he's built an awesome business. It's so. not not tough to get that's, me going. That's, that's for great. sure when it comes to talking, right? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but Stefan, uh, you know, I met you a few years ago, and, and we had a lot of mutual friends. Still, we have a lot of mutual friends, and I've heard of, heard everybody else talking about about this cool dude, Stefan, and uh, uh, the, the the things he was, you were doing back then. And, and I got the opportunity to meet you, and I said, all right, I get it. I get why everybody's excited to be friends with this guy. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, your, your, uh, your story is awesome. And, uh, I, I, we basically want you to kind of tell it, right. I mean, yeah. basically from, you know, your, where, where you, where you, uh, got your work ethic from your upbringing, right. If you can start right from the, right from the start, kind of as a kid, right. your, your life as a kid and where you, how, who, how you became who you are. Well, so I was born and raised in, in Paris and, uh, my, so I have two sisters, my parents owned. So, so the, so the accent it is real. It is real. I, I, I always thought it was fake, but, but it is real cute, just so you know. Well, uh, it used to be like the Inspector Clouseau, but uh, <laughs> now, now it is better because I have spent uh, 30 years here. So, But now I learned English early because my parents um, had a uh, an international shipping company called Rambo International, Rambo being a family name that my grandfather had started in Paris in thirty one. Wow. He died in the Second World War. My dad took over the company when he was young. He was about 19, 1920. Wow. And he grew it with my mom. So my dad was the CEO and the owner, and my mom was the CFO. And they grew the business to about 500 employees. And how, so big, how big was it when your, when your grandfather, uh, uh, he got killed in World War II? Yeah, and um, he was a pilot. Oh, and wow. so he, you know, the company was not that big, but it was very profitable. He was very successful. It was very interesting story for so another a little, day a little but a few million dollar company or something like that per year or? yeah but you know he had his own airplane already uh -huh. he was in his 30s he was driving a delay and he had a property with a landing strip i mean it was quite wow. something in the 30s wow. so all that disappeared after he died and uh, the war and all that and my dad basically had to you know start over with my mom and rebuild the business so you know that's the environment in which i was raised uh, upper middle class Catholic boarding school, very strict upbringing, strict parents. Mm -hmm. You didn't get anything you didn't deserve. Um, not like today when the the last one gets a medal. You know, yeah. I barely got a medal if I finish first. <laughs> <laughs> that was, you know, um, kick, maybe a kick in the butt because you didn't win by enough of a margin. Probably, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, but I worked. You know, I worked every summer in the uh, in the business. You know, I mostly played tennis and chase girls and worked in the family business to learn how to load on load containers and you know do documentation deal with customs how old were you uh, how old were you when you first had your first experiences around the business probably about 13 i'd say mm -hmm. um so you know i got all the all the shitty jobs you know whenever my friends would come to the the company and say you know we're looking for stefan rambo the receptionist would usually say oh yeah he's He's at the end of the warehouse over there sweeping. <laughs> you know, th those are the jobs. But anyway, so, um, you know, I guess I was lucky in a sense to know that I would always do this, uh -huh. um, you know, international logistics. And, and eventually, you know, when I completed my education in France, I did some internships around the world, at, you know, a few months in Germany, uh, in England. And then I came to the States, which was supposed to be you know, for a year or two, and it un and ended up being 30. Wow. And, 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 the, 
And I just couldn't leave this country. It's just such a great country. Yeah, and then, and so. and why did you were, you were you was it one of these things where you left to to learn stuff outside the family business and then come yeah. back? That was the idea. Yeah, my parents always thought that I needed to make my mistakes uh-huh. elsewhere and learn from others. Yeah, you know, instead of of just being a you know a daddy's boy from day one, mm-hmm. uh, which never really appealed to me anyway. Yeah, I wanted to do my my own thing. So came here. Um, to, so in our business, when you don't have an office of your own overseas, you need to have an agent. So an agent sure. is the equivalent of a distributor. Okay. So it's someone who would receive the goods on your behalf, clear customs, um, collect the funds from the customer overseas, and then remit them to you, split profit 50-50 or whatever mm-hmm. the deal is, right? So. Uh, my family's business didn't have offices overseas, so they had agents all over the world. Mm-hmm. And I happened to just come to Rambo International's agent in Chicago. It was a small customs broker in Elgro Village. And um, after a few months, I told the, the lady who ran it that I didn't think she was running it the right way, and, and I had a plan. And so I got fired. Mm. And I thought maybe I should go back to France and go back to the family business and, and just well, work you, there. So you got fired for just saying, yeah, I don't think you're running the right way. I think there's a better way to run this. Yeah, and, uh, yeah but sure. I was in my early 20s, so <laughs> that was not acceptable. Uh, it's acceptable in my organization. I love people I, questioning the status quo. Yeah, well, that, that wasn't the culture here. No, it wasn't to her. So <laughs> my dad said, you're not coming back. You're going to find me another agent. Wow. And you're going to build the trade between France and Chicago. And then I'll decide when, you know, it's acceptable for you to come back and, and enter the family business. So I found this little company called Phoenix International in the mid-80s. How, how old were you at this point, Stefan? 22. Okay. So, um, and then I started to work. Um, you know, there was, a, there was an understanding that I would stay, you know, a year or two years. Um, and see how international trade is done here on this side of the Atlantic and, and then develop, you know, the, we didn't have a lot of, there was not a lot of competition between Paris and Chicago. You know, a lot of our competitors traded between, you know, France and New York and mm-hmm. France in LA. And okay. Chicago was not a very well-known market. And so we thought it could be a, an interesting niche market for us and for Rambo International to develop ocean freight and air freight consolidations, you know, every week, several times a week for the air freight. And so, but I studied in operations here. You know, it was, the language was challenging for me. Um, I think my German at the time was better than my English. Wow. But I haven't spoken German in about 30 years, so that's that's gone. But, um, so, you know, that that was tough. The, the geography, the language. Mm-hmm. Um, what, was then, the, what was the name of that company? Phoenix oh, International. Phoenix. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All so, right. um, operations, and then I went into sales, and um, I became the uh, top producer pretty quickly of the company. We only had one office. It was in uh, in Algrove Village, and it was a small company. We were, you know, twenty or thirty. And, uh, twenty, thirty people. Employees. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. And um, so. After a while, I was, you know, each salesperson had an out-of-town territory, mm-hmm. and mine was uh, Michigan and and uh, San Luis. So I would go once a month to those markets and see customers and, and try and get their business. And um, I had some good success in San Luis and, and Kansas City. And one day I asked the owner if I could maybe open up an office in San Luis. Mm-hmm. And um, my father thought it was a crazy idea because I, he considered I knew nothing, mm-hmm. and uh, which he was probably right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and and the owner Bill thought, you know, why not? He had family in St. Louis. We didn't have an office there. We didn't have offices anywhere but uh-huh. Chicago, and uh, so he said, sure, you know, let's let's do it. So, you know, really, that's kind of how it. It all started. It was, you know, this. I wanted to have my own thing. You know, if it was not going to be, you know, eventually I would go back to the family business. But I wanted to kind of have my yeah. own thing here in earn America. Your, earn your own stripes here. Yeah, and so 
that's kind of how it started. And you know, when when I look back and I and I think of you know forks in in my life, mm-hmm. you know, key decisions. That was that was the first one that was I think significant because instead of just working in the Chicago office or doing other things, I started with you know one employee who I hired. It was my first employee. She still works for the company today. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, her name is Kathleen, and um, so you know she did the operations. I did the sales. You know, very much like you, very aggressive, hitting the street, seeing as many customers as possible. And uh, we felt we had, you know, some superior products in in many respects. And, you know, we were non-asset based. All we did was international air freight and ocean freight and customs brokerage and, you know, supply chain management. Mm -hmm. It really wasn't called supply chain management in the 80s. You know, that's a fancy term today, but (laughs) uh, everything's becoming very fancy in terms of you know terms but um so you know that's that's where it started and no, and this is really before so much technology i mean it's, it's yeah a, well, way before all this all this uh 3pl th- third party logistics world we have today people right? were not even talking about you know the term logistics really applied at the time for big warehouses that stored mm-hmm. managed and distributed freight okay Today, people use logistics for international transportation too, for truck brokerage, for mm-hmm. anything that has to do with transportation, whether domestic or international. So um, within three years, we became bigger. The St. Louis office became bigger and more profitable than the Chicago headquarters. Wow, wow. three years. Yeah, and that's, you know, then I opened up in Kansas City and, you know, other parts of the country. And in 91 or two, I told the uh, the two other owners that it was time for me to go back to France to the family mm-hmm. business. And this and, is after like six years. Yeah, just about. Yeah, and uh, and they said, well, what what would it take for you to you know commit to stay here a little bit longer? And I said, you know, equity, and that's kind of how that conversation started, and and eventually, I became. You know the third owner of the company. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. And um, at a in your late twenties, at a young age, yeah, wow. twenty seven, twenty eight. So in those like in those first six years of you growing a business, I guess what would probably be some you called it forks in a row that you feel like maybe some entrepreneurs today, if they were listening to this, they like, hey, well, you know, this is kind of from my experience. If you were just kind of, especially in I guess logistics or whatever we would call it right, today. Right. Um, Watch out for this, or you know, just from my experience, you know, these are some things that you all might want to implement now, so you can scale like you did in in basically six years. I mean, I think that's a kudos to you to have two people who led it to say, "Hey, listen, we would give you equity to stay here because you're just so valuable." Right. Well, you know, I think when when I see certain businesses today and startups, uh, because I work with some of them, that um, you know, think of raising money and they start with beautiful offices and nice furniture and because because that's what they like Mm -hmm. and you know we were on all four building our furniture three days before we opened up in San Luis right it was some cheap Ikea stuff the cheapest (laughs) stuff we could find (laughs) and you know I put it together myself with a screwdriver and you know our offices were very basic and very small Mm -hmm. And we watched our expenses very carefully. And I think, you know, that's kind of lost nowadays. People want to have the beautiful office, the beautiful mm-hmm. stuff. You need to raise capital. Invested, we need to raise capital, ra- right? Raise they raise capital. capital, and all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden they're choking because, you know, they have to uh, perform under great pressure, pay back. Uh, mm-hmm. The return might might not be what the investors expected, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we didn't have outside investors. We were very thrifty. We were very determined. We were very passionate. And we just worked relentlessly. And, you know, the, the salesperson I hired, the first salesperson I hired in St. Louis, uh, his name was, was Ed Fisher, uh, was one of the best in, in, in town. And I think, you know, he was about 10 years older than, than I was. He still is. But, you know, I, <laughs> I lied about my age because I felt I was too young to attract the talent that I needed. Mm-hmm. Um, so, 
Um, but we became, you know, a very tight group of hardworking people who really enjoyed to be with each other. And, you know, we just loved winning. And uh, we started to build some great consolidations directly. You know, we did things that, that nobody else did. Uh, we had direct consolidations from Taiwan, Hong Kong, Shanghai, directly into St. Louis. You know, wow. everybody else had them into LA and Chicago, and then it was trucked to St. Louis. Hmm. We brought the freight all the way to St. Louis. So we saved like a week in transit time, wow. you know, for an ocean freight shipment, which is considerable. You know, it's 25%. Huge. Yeah. And, you know, in air freight, we were open on Sundays to clear through customs and deliver the freight on Monday morning while our competitors would deliver on Tuesday or Wednesday. You know, it was constantly, you know, we're trying to, you know, as Gary always mentions about his business here, you know, we do this better and we do it faster and this is why. And that's what, you know, our business, we never viewed our business as being rocket science, but we just try to, you know, be quicker and better and, and more reliable um, than, than our competitors. We, you know, still today, there are 400, there are 4,000 international shipping companies mm. in the country. I mean... Wow, in the U.S. Yeah, 300 in, at, you know, around O'Hare alone. How it's many were there back then, though? About 4,000. 4, same. Wow. It doesn't change. Just yeah, and in St. Louis, there were about 30 at the time. They just operate totally different today than they did back then, but yeah. there's still a similar amount. Yeah. In and out of business, maybe 50% of them not there anymore yeah. or whatever from then. But Yeah, and, and, you know, technology plays a much greater role mm -hmm. today, as you said, you know, as it did then. And, you know, then it was more, how great are your people? Mm -hmm. How great are your processes? Is your billing accurate? You know, that's always been an issue in our business. Yeah. You know, <laughs> little fees everywhere, little stuff, and yeah. customers would get upset with billing. And yeah. So, what, what's, you know, What was it, when you talk about wins, like you guys were having a lot of wins and, you're, and you had a, a team that would you know, understood how to, how to win. What was a win back then that... that uh, Just getting a new customer. Uh, so, so from, you know, one of, one of our key markets, because we would leverage all our customers, our margins were, were good. It was important to focus on trade lanes. You know, it was really all about focus. We didn't just get, we wouldn't be that interested in getting a customer that imported from Buenos Aires, you know, in Argentina to San Luis, because we were just, we were not that good mm -hmm. from that origin. We didn't have anything significant so you stayed, to You stayed offer. in your lane. We you, stayed in our lane. And you focused on that all the time. You Very knew, early you knew, your, you knew your lane and yeah. focused on your lane. It I was Europe. Just, yep. It was Europe and, and it was taken, Asia. Didn't, take, didn't get taken off into another lane because you thought you could uh, compete at that one too. You said, hey, this we're great at. His we're yeah. going to stay great until you discovered something different. Yeah. And, you know, I think we did that till until 2012, until we sold the business. You know, I, I was one of my favorite books was always uh, Nuts from Herb Keller, the CEO of, uh, of Southwest. And it was all about you know, that focus, continue. It's it called to, nuts? Yeah, because that's what they serve you when you sit oh. in, a, <laughs> I didn't know that. in a Southwest plane, you yeah, know, yeah. they give you nuts. Yeah. And so the title of that book was nuts. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a remarkable business book because it was really the story of a man who had built an exceptional company by just doing what you said, okay. you know, doing more of what you're great at mm -hmm. as opposed mm -hmm. to constantly you know, McDonald's buying Chipotle, they realized that was really dumb, right? And, because And Redbox. Yeah, and, and <laughs> because it's insignificant compared to yeah. the business they're really good at. And, you know, at Phoenix, people always said, why don't you do domestic? Why don't you do this? No. We did ocean freight, air freight, mm -hmm. international customs brokerage for 30 years. And, you know, we became the largest um, private company in that sector in America. And we hit a billion dollars, and it was you hit, you hit a what? A billion. Wow, that's awesome. So when we sold in 2012, we we were at a billion dollars. But you know, we we focused on the Midwest, then the coasts, then we opened up um, in Asia in '95. Um, I spearheaded that in '95 with. Uh, our agent in Taiwan and, and Shanghai at the time. And that was another fork. It was a big decision. And then Europe in the late 90s. So those were really our big markets, you know, Asia, so Europe. This, so this isn't like a huge market cap. It's, it's, a, it's a big market cap, but this is in the billions, right? 
but it's not like you know, I mean when, when I think about freight I hear you know 350 billion 400 billion whatever this is a, this is a, a market market space within that space of is it a 10 billion 20 billion dollar market space or oh it's a, yeah it's a very large market I don't know, it's okay. 150 billion like 150 or, I mean billion. It, yeah it's a really uh, I think maybe today it might be about 200 200 billion global in the US oh just the US yeah it's a it's a very, very large uh, awesome. trade. So very fragmented also then. Extremely fragmented. Yeah. So, well, that's why you have companies today like XPO, you know, Brian Jacobs from the East Coast uh, who starts XPO and, and he, you know, he buys companies and um, leverages their strength and, you know, put them all on one platform and, mm-hmm. and et cetera, et cetera. And, and he's building, you know, I think he's got an $11 billion company already and he started six or seven years ago. Right. So. As I said, 4,000 in this country, and, and you know the top 30, um, you know represent maybe 25 percent or 30 percent, you know of the market. So okay. um, I'm sure some of those numbers have changed. But you know what's interesting is, so we sold our company to, to C. H. Robinson eventually in, in 2012, and you know Robinson with Phoenix combined only had one percent market share. Wow. And C.H. Robinson today is a $16 billion, you know, Fortune sure. 250 company. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's serious. Yeah. You know, it's big numbers. And so, yeah, it's. I think it's a fascinating uh, industry and space. And, you know, I'm so glad in a way my grandfather got us started. I mean, obviously, I'm, you know, I didn't get involved with the family business. Eventually, when my dad saw that I was staying here, he sold the business in 93 mm-hmm. to, a, to a Swedish conglomerate. But, you know, it, it all started with Paul Rambo, my grandfather, who who started a logistics company in 31 in Paris. Became, became part, part, part of your bloodline. Yeah. Right, exactly, yeah. So I'm the, th- you know, I'm the third generation. And... Uh, but third, you know, the neat thing is third generation, but but you know, it, it, it did aspire to, it aspired to be here eventually, be mm-hmm. in your own thing eventually, and it became your own thing. How, how, how did the partnership work out with the two partners you had? Where did that go to before 2012 and all that? So that's, that's a good question because one of the two partners eventually retired uh, in the early 2000s. And so I told you about 95 when we opened up in Asia. That was, I think that was probably the most sig- significant leap forward okay. for us in 30 years um, because Asia was already our biggest market. That was the market I was involved with the most. I was going to Asia almost every other month, mm-hmm. spending a lot of time there. We had become a market leader from Taiwan, Hong Kong, Shanghai, um, Southeast Asia, Singapore, Malaysia, to, to the States. Those were all imports. And um, one day, in 1995, I get a phone call from, from my agent who says, hey, uh, things are not well here with the owner, and um, we're thinking of leaving, and we're going to open up our own company. Wow. And we'd like you to be our agent, to remain our agent. And I said, wait a minute, let me, I'll be right there. <laughs> so I'm in St. Louis at the time, and the guy who's calling me is in Taiwan. So you know, I got dressed, packed my bag, and got a ticket and uh, and I was in Taiwan the next day and basically we over the following two three weeks we put a plan together um, a lot of which was on on napkins <laughs> one night at a restaurant called the Portofino in Taipei <laughs> and it was napkins we've kept them somewhere and we put a plan together of you know the all the cash we needed you know we we were not gonna seek you know outside funds either mm-hmm. um, you know, the guy I was with was Andy, uh, who was, you know, the key in Asia, our key contact. And basically, we decided, um, without me even talking to my partners in the U.S., because I thought it would actually frighten them, and they were not as familiar with the Asian trade as I was, Mm -hmm. and the relationship with Andy in Asia was mine, essentially, so I trusted him. We put together a plan to open up Phoenix International in Asia. So in, in June of 95, we opened up in Taipei, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Shaman, and Singapore in one month. Wow. And wow. that put us on the map. Um, in, your, your partners bought into in this Asia. eventually then? Or? So when I <clears throat> came back to Chicago and, and we spoke about it at first. Brought were, your napkins yeah, with you? Yeah, yeah, they were like, we're not doing this. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, okay. no, it's way too risky. And, uh, but eventually they, uh, they came around. But 
but one of the two partners eventually retired, and we brought Andy as uh, our partner. So okay. really, the the partnership. Now, is this an, after an, that. an Asian uh, gentleman mm-hmm. named Andy? Yeah, uh, okay. born and Seems raised like in a, Taipei. Sounds like a very, American name. Very good. Well, you know, Asians. <laughs> his real name was Jen Wen, Jen yeah. Wen Wong. Uh-huh. But his U.S. name Same was Andy Wong. Andy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> they all they all had that because they, you know, if you did business with America, it was needed, not that easy to be Jen Wen. Shorten that name up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. How do you spell that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you um so I, I, you I mean in my mind I would think it's pretty risky to you know oh yeah you know Lucia actually start this business internationally yeah don't worry about my partners I, I'll take care of that how did you get them to buy in because I would think that caused a lot of friction and I'm pretty sure it did at that time yeah it did yes, young, and, young, and young punk partner right so, yeah, you know I got this deal done in Asia it's right here on these napkins let me show you <laughs> yeah no and they were you know threats and this and that and, and arguments and but you know I told them look. Andy's our friend. We've worked with him for years in Asia. We trust him. And that's always the biggest issue Mm, when you're going to do business Mm. around the world in general, but I would say particularly in places like Mm. China, India, South America. You know, there's a, there are lots of shady characters. Yeah. Thieves and and unethical people around the world, period. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, we had two things going in our favor. We we knew and trusted Andy, I did, and we controlled all our business because mm. imports from Asia is paid by the importer in America, and that is the party that det- decides who oh, will handle okay. their supply chain. Gotcha. So we could move our business around to whoever, right? A lot of our competitors were saying, well, you're using Phoenix International, but they don't even have their own offices overseas. So you know the service is not going to be that great. It's not them. It's an agent. (laughs) Sure. So, you know, it was important for us to start opening up our own entities so we could control the supply chain ourselves on both sides. Sure. We didn't lose one customer in the transition. Um, We almost ran out of cash the following year because it was just too much in one year. Um, That was a big test, a big stress test in 96, 97. Um, I think we only made that year like barely a million dollars. Um, in business, there was now what, re- what type of revenues? At uh, that point? We probably, <coughs> you know, if you included Asia and and removed all the, you know, the the double billing, I don't know, it mm-hmm. probably was four hundred, you know, three four hundred million bucks. Right. We just had to make you grown know, three, too fast. Three tenths of one percent, basically. Yeah, yeah, we had grown too fast, but we almost. I felt we almost didn't have a choice. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, time would would show us that you, you we were the, right. You saw a huge opportunity in front of you, and yeah. the investment was was perfect. Yeah, I mean, and by you know, by the time we sold the business, but yeah, by the time we sold the business, um, I think you know, China represented forty percent of our, wow. you know, EBITDA. So, it, so it was the you know, it was the right call. Mm-hmm. But there was another fork, you know, uh, an important one opening up St. Louis, deciding to stay in America, mm-hmm. and having the courage to do Asia in 95. I think those were the three, you know. The I, biggest I, pivots in I, your yeah. career. Yeah, and I think sometimes people make the wrong decision and and it just doesn't end well for them. Mm-hmm. And I always say, you know, there was also, it was a lot of instincts, but it's also a lot of luck, you know. I mean, yeah. you can never forget about that. Mm-hmm. You know, I was lucky in many instances. You're, lu- you're lucky to have these opportunities, but but also um, sharp enough to take advantage of these opportunities. Yeah, you know, I think I think luck is part of everything we do in our lives, yeah. but also opportunities that we take advantage of are are are, the, are huge, right? And, yeah. and if you could define luck, just because I think a lot of people feel like luck is like, oh, well, you're lucky. That's why you got what you got. But I think, at least how I look at it, you know, I, I call it, you know, preparation. You know, luck it could be preparation where opportunity met. Like you were more prepared for it. So, you know, could right. you define what luck is so people can understand there's a difference between lucky like the lottery and, yeah. you know, opportunity that gives you the luck that you look talking about? Well, first of all, you know, the, the luck to be born in a family like that, that enabled me to even know about this space and to have this opportunity to come to America. I think that's tremendous already. Of course, mm-hmm. I would have said, no, I'm not going to America. I'm staying in <laughs> yeah. Paris. I love it here. If you knew nothing about it. Yeah, exactly. But so... I think, yeah, it was 
you know, some opportunities that, that were there in front of me and, and, uh, and, I, and I grabbed them. You know, Angie could have gone south on us. Uh, the business could have gone the other way, gone to the competition. Um, you know, we could potentially not have survived 1996 when we had no cash in our bank account and we each had to mortgage everything we own and mm-hmm. sell everything we own and mm-hmm. put money back in the business. I mean, these were very trying times that turned out to be very good for us because I think it made us a better company afterwards. But, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe, you know, because of my upbringing, I was, uh, you know, I made some decisions one way that I otherwise would have made another way. Well, and, and, so. and you, for, for you to be, you know, you were the younger of the partners at that point, right? Oh, Two yeah. other partners yeah. older than you? Yeah, by about 10 years. So for you to be risking and, and putting everything on the line at that point, right? Boy, that, that take a lot of guts. But for them to be, be buying into this young this partner that's that's right. pushing them to Asia and all that too had to be stressful for them as well. Right? Yeah, it was. It, it strained the relationship for a little bit. But, you know, we were always a, a tight group. And, I mean, imagine by the time we sold the business, we had been together about 27, 28 years. I think that's longer than most marriages. Yeah. Yeah. So... <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, way way longer than most. Way long, right, <laughs> like exactly. about ten times longer than most. <clears throat> so yeah. Okay, so so when you, when this uh, when, when this was going on, I mean, uh, what were the what were the big differentiators you were able to offer that that maybe a competitor couldn't to, to have to, to to have the guts to go to the, these other markets like you, as you did? Yeah, I think uh, you know products started to evolve, vendor management programs. You know, so imagine a porter, uh, an importer here like. Uh, you know, Horn Furniture, Pampered Chef, I'm using, you know, Chicago companies, Caterpillar, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. companies like that. They have lots of John Deere. You know, they have lots of vendors throughout China and Asia. And I think, you know, a problem uh, was that they would ship directly, you know, they would not import directly from those vendors. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we were proposing at the time, a little bit ahead of our competition, vendor management, which is that we would really start to control their purchasing and their supply chain. So we would get EDI messages from them that would show us all their purchases. Mm -hmm. We would contact all their suppliers and we would start organizing the shipping and the loading of containers by combining that freight together. We, We saved some of those importers, you know, 20, 30% on their supply chain. It was significant. And a lot of it was, you know, digitally done, uh, you know, with our platform behind the scene. But a lot of it was, you know, a lot of uh, manual work at Origins, you know, in our warehouses of, of uh, physical consolidation. So you, so you focus on solving the problems, really. Exactly. Solving the problems of, the, of, yeah. of both sides of this this thing, right? Yeah. Which is huge. Yeah, and they could see almost live, um, you know, what we had in our facilities overseas. And they could tell us, ship this, don't ship that because there's another big purchase order that's going to come and it will make for a perfect 40 foot container as opposed to a 20 foot container so you know a lot of those programs we felt that we had to be there physically have our own people Mm -hmm. Um, we built a very strong relationship with some of those vendors overseas because we felt it was important too so because very often you know the, the the chinese vendor would say well i called phoenix international but nobody answered or I asked them to pick up my freight, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. You know, they would always point the finger at somebody else. So we felt it was important to build relationships on both sides of the Pacific. And did those relationships grow into other things too? I got to believe if you're building a relationship with that, with the uh, the, the manufacturer on the one side, they ship to other importers. Yeah. Now you're finding about other. And they want to work with you. Exactly. No, absolutely. So those relationships grew because of that, probably, huh? Yeah. No, you got that right. I mean, it was uh, worked out well. Tell us about the culture. I mean, I, you, you had to build a, a company with good culture, values, and such. And then, and then, if you could tell us about the culture you had here in America, and then, and then, how that culture traveled when you went to Asia, and what they look like. Did you keep it the same? Did you, did you have to change? <laughs> Even the Phoenix name was the Phoenix name a good name there compared to here? Well, you know. Yeah. Good questions. You've you've done this before. <laughs> oh, I've, I've heard stories. He actually took them out of my uh, notebook. Out of your book? Was, yeah, he took them out of my notebook. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, you know, the Phoenix was a good name. I mean, it's rising from your ashes, uh-huh. and um, so that was a that was a really good name in uh, in Mandarin. As far as the culture was concerned, you know, we we had a very strong culture at at Phoenix here. We had, you know, we always thought 
uh, us partners thought we had a lot to do with it. But um, you know, I think our VP of HR, uh, Laurie, who uh, who actually works at Medline Industries nowadays. Medline. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Medline. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the mills. So um, she she was like. Uh, you know, that lady at, at Southwest Airline, I don't remember her name anymore. She was the right arm of Herb Keller, the CEO. Mm -hmm. She was the president and she was the one behind the culture of Southwest. And Laurie at Phoenix was, was a little bit that way as well. We, you know, we, we had a very much a, uh, a family type culture. Um, we had a, a lower turnover than most anyone in our industry. I think we hired really well you know i always remember the sentence we we hired for attitude and trained for skills mm -hmm. and that's what we did you know we were very we we hired slowly and fired swiftly although that sounds really bad Not but much. i wish more businesses would do that because there's nothing worse than keeping the wrong employee on both sides of the fence yeah. the, the employee and the employer it's no good for either yeah. one right yeah exactly so you know, we had a strong uh, sense of, you know, I was, as I was waiting for you, I was looking at your values on the wall. You know, they were our values. They were, a, you know, a strong sense of ethics, hardworking. Uh, I don't know if being passionate is a value, but that's something that we viewed as something extremely mm -hmm. important. Yeah, we do too. And um, we invested a ton in uh, training. We had, by the time we sold the business, we had five training centers in the country, which was a big expense. Yeah. But we wanted to do our own training. You know, shipping is complicated. Our system was complicated. And, you know, our employees wanted to get better and they wanted to make a difference. Mm -hmm. By the time we sold the business, you know, the average tenure of each person on the management team was 17 years. Wow. In a 32 year old company. I mean, Robinson That's couldn't awesome. believe it. So, you know, there was a lot of friendship and taking care of your neighbor. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we were very good at that. We partied a lot when we were younger. <laughs> Celebrated. <laughs> but we were at work at 8 the next morning. Uh -huh. um, and we just, you know, we had a good time as we were building this. I always say the statement, where there's unity, there's community. And obviously exactly. that's kind of what it seems like what you all had. So. Yeah, and something else we did early on, and that was Bill's idea to... to make the company a, an ESOP, an employee stock ownership plan type company. So about 10% of the company was owned by um, our, you know, more senior um, employees. So by the time we sold the business, we made a bunch of, created a bunch of millionaires, mm -hmm. right? Um, and these were people that didn't expect it. They were so thankful. They were, you know, happy to be part of the company and have helped it grow. And, uh, we were very proud to be able to to see them get that financial reward, which you know very often employees are left behind when yeah. the ownership of a company sells. So that wasn't the case for us. Awesome. And then and then uh, in the sale, you know, was there a big cultural shift, or was C H Robinson have some of the same values, and then did they fit well, and and did most of the people stay? Uh, yeah, um, you know, Ray and I talk very often about. You know what what to do when you sell your business and and you talk about you know if if the cultures don't match the sale will be a flop there's mm. there's no doubt about it we you know luckily there were a lot of companies that wanted to buy us so we we got to pick and the culture was particularly important for us geographically the fact that we were Chicago based and Robinson was Minnesota based that was good too CEO, great guy. He just he announced his retirement last week. He'll he'll stay as, as the chairman. But we got along great. John Weehoff. Uh, when we sold to them, they were nine billion, right? Very strong culture at Robinson. Um, just very good company, and yeah, bigger. So mm -hmm. that was you know that was a change for our people. Um, things took longer to happen sometimes, particularly you know our benefits were better than theirs and you know <laughs> things like that and employees look at that sure um so but i think you know by and large it worked out well you know something that we did that i think is really important when you sell your business was to 
you know, to give retention bonuses to your key people. Hmm. We had zero departure. You know, awesome. we, we made people understand that they were very important for the future mm -hmm. of, of the, the combined entity. I stayed for another three years. So essentially, there were no change for our people, right? Right, and we had retention bonuses. That was an added incentive, uh, you know, for the f next two years. Um, so you know, people would give it a shot, right? And yeah. they they liked it. So they're part today of a you know sixteen billion dollar organization, and uh, that's more powerful, maybe a little safer because mm -hmm. it's a lot bigger. Right. Um, you know, it depends on what matters yeah, to the, people. Yeah. yeah. But. Uh, and and do you feel like the the a big entity like that has the the ability, or does this you know not all do and most don't, but a big entity like this has the ability to, to change and ability to 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 pivot in and all that like you used to. I mean, that's probably the thing I think about the most when a big entity takes on a, a smaller, more more nimble right yeah. business. You know, I had. Uh, a month before the sale was was final, I had uh, dinner with John, and he said, "You know, you got to remember, you know, you look full of you know energy and passionate and all that, and and you guys have made some crazy decisions that turned out great over time, uh, but you got to remember, you know, if you compare Robinson and Phoenix, we're like this big ship going down the ocean. There you go. It takes us a long time." you know, to turn even five degrees, mm -hmm. and you're like driving this little red car, yeah. <laughs> and you, you know, you can do a 180 whenever you feel like it. And it was, you know, when it came to certain things, it was, it was a good analogy. Uh, things didn't move very fast in some respects, but we were the biggest acquisition they made in 100 years to date. It's wow. still, we are still their biggest acquisition. It was about 700 million bucks. Mm -hmm. And they were committed and and that was something that was really important to, to us and to me. They were committed to letting us run our business the way we successfully had for the past 30 years. Right. You know, John said, we've, we've bought lots of companies before you and we've managed to wreck them. <laughs> so this is the first time we're actually putting the guy, the CEO of the company we buy, in charge. Wow. And that tells a lot about the confidence they had in you, which is awesome. Yeah, and you know, as I said, John was was just a very, very savvy CEO and, and chairman. So, so tell us on, on the way up to to this point, you know, what, who were the mentors? I mean, you had your dad, right? Your grandfather's story, your dad, right? I mean, your grandfather, number one, a hero, right? Mm -hmm. um, your 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 father, who was an entrepreneur and, and and again, a you know business builder, right? Tell me, tell me about a few of the the few of the the mentors you look upon as this is who who's who I wanted to be, and this is who I, you know, I became maybe in a certain sense. Yeah, I would say both my parents. I think they did a very good job running the business. Mm -hmm. Completely different. My dad was more like you and I, you know, very aggressive. Let's go and build this and create a new service and mm -hmm. get some more business. And my mom was more the HR and finance part. Um, you know, they, they were inspirations. Uh, my partner, Bill, who was, you know, my boss before he became my partner. Um, you know, what always amazed me was it was crazy of, of him to tell me, you know, at such an early age, oh, you want to open up in St. Louis? Let's do it in a year. Yeah, okay, yeah. So does that work for you? I'm like, sure. <laughs> and that's crazy, right? Yeah. But, but that's America. Mm -hmm. And if I had worked for a hundred different people, they would have said, oh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Relax, young man. You're 20 something, <laughs> what do you we'll know? We'll talk in 10 yeah, or 15 what, years. Yeah, what do you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, which certainly would have happened in Europe anyway, right? Mm. I mean. Even my dad would not have told me, yeah, open up an office in Lyon or in Lille or in Bordeaux or, mm -hmm. you know, not a chance. So I think, you know, that was very, um, you know, as I aged and I had more people working for me, uh, I never considered that being too young was a thing. Mm -hmm. And that's so not European. Yeah. You know, you need to... Either your pedigree needs to be this, or your age, or your accomplishments, or whatever, right? Uh -huh. But, you know, Bill was like, let's do it. And for me, that was, that was America. You know, mm -hmm. it was, let's take a chance. The worst thing that can happen is that we fail. And, mm -hmm. and I think I took that with me for the 
till today. Um, I, you know, when I do something, I never think that it can fail. Yeah. Which is probably the dumbest thing. But I've got that st- the same you stupid, know what I mean? stupid mentality. But yeah. if you work hard, it seems to work out very often anyway. Yeah. yeah. Not always. I mean, you know, you've you certainly have a lot of companies. I'm sure they've, you know, they've not all performed exactly the way you wanted them to. No. Okay. Well, let's move on and do something else. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, yeah, that's been amazing about this country. I mean, this is when it comes to business. This is yeah. Talk talk about that. I mean, you, this you, is the best you, place you know, in the world. You know the whole world. I mean, you've been around the world and you've, you've done business everywhere. You you grew up somewhere else. Yeah. Tell us about America because I I I'm, I'm very passionate about our country and, and the free enterprise system. I talk about it a lot, and uh, I'd love, love to hear your, your position. yeah. I mean, it's you know, I was in Paris last week and 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 I read Le Figaro, which is the biggest French paper, every morning when I wake up and I. And every time I'm like, ah, oh, I'm so glad to be here. Mm. I, you know, I have both citizenships. I'm French and American. I love being French. But this is, if you want to really have a chance, uh, you know, if you're half smart, uh, if you're passionate about something, if you're full of energy, you want to accomplish something, this is the place. You know, this is the greatest market economy um, you know, people can slam on capitalism all they want, um, but this is the country of the opportunity, like we say in France. Mm-hmm. And um, it's you know, I think I'm an example of it. You yeah. know, it's mm-hmm. I was nobody ever said, "Oh no, you can't do that." Mm-hmm. You know, the Asia thing, it was a calculated risk. I knew we control the business and the relationship, so I was not too scared. Mm-hmm. But and there was more because yeah it was just big and you know there was it was fair enough to have a conversation around it sure but in general i've never heard oh yeah no you can't do that this is america you yeah. can do anything here awesome so, absolutely and and uh, yeah you're 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 an awesome example of that and and again i something that that we talk about a lot q and i and we on, on this uh, podcast is is that you know it, these opportunities aren't abundant across the globe this is this is the place in the world that's developed a huge percentage of, of, the, of the world's innovation in the last 200 years oh, yeah. um, for one reason, mm-hmm. because of the free enterprise system. And, and we, you know, we, we, you know, when you study these things, and I do as much as I can, I, I'm, I'm always amazed at, at the stories like yours and ours and, and that, that come about because of that, right? Because yeah, it's a lot more challenging to open up and run a business in, in Paris or you know, in Shanghai as it is here. Mm-hmm. In many respects, I mean, of course, it depends on the state and it depends on all sorts of things. But um, I think still today, it's uh, you know, it's as exciting to be here, and I think the potential is at least as great today as it was, you know, in the mid to late eighties. Yep, I, so. I agree. You know, I, I always say that you know we just can't be complacent and, and think it's here forever, right? Yeah. If we don't protect it, it won't yeah. be, right? For our kids and our grandkids, and that's the important thing is, you know, I, I, we want to tell these stories. Q and I want to continually tell these stories like yours because right. we want people to understand this. this it's here. It, mm-hmm. it, it's not guaranteed. Yeah, and you know, I think something that's important. Um, so if 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 you forget about this these few months in that company where you know, where I worked and I, and I got sacked, which by the way was a great experience. There's nothing better than getting fired at least once in your life. <laughs> so, so you know how it feels the yeah. next time you fire someone. Mm-hmm. Um, but, so I worked for the same company for 30 years, right? That's it. Mm-hmm. And, and I think nowadays, um, you know, I have a, a son who's, uh, who's 28 and a daughter who's gonna be 27 and, and they too, stick to you know the the companies they work for and and uh and they're not always looking for you know the next interview and and the next potential company and but i see a lot of that you Mm -hmm. know and it's maybe it's a millennial thing maybe maybe it's the way it will be going forward but you know people just think that they have to change companies Mm -hmm. every three years or five years to be paid more to learn more Mm -hmm. to you know, and that's potentially true, but there is something to be said, I think, about sticking to one company um, and learning as much as you can 
in that field. Of course, it depends on the management of the company, sure. how well they treat you and what the opportunities are. But but it's okay to to stay with the same company well, if you for find a while. The, if you find the right culture and the right fit, yeah. it's, it's a great thing. And and I and again, we look at resumes all the time. And and too often, you're right. Too often, it's, you see that jumping around. You know, right. Twenty years. Twenty years. They're in they're they're in the working world, and they worked for twenty five companies. Yeah. Or or, it's crazy. or fifteen years, and it's uh, ten companies. You know, when we see somebody that's been been on board in a few companies in twenty years, right, or a couple companies, or mm-hmm. one, we like, oh my gosh, this person, right, loyalty, right, uh, yeah. f- focus, mm-hmm. not jumping ship for a couple bucks more an hour, right, mm-hmm. or whatever that might be. Yeah. Um, that's big because you know, our our biggest investment is is, is to find great people, right, right? and to lo- any to lose a, a a person costs us a lot of dough, right. Oh, yeah. So so if we can focus on on finding the right people. And 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 you know basically uh, nurturing their 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 livelihood with education and everything else, then then we're in great shape, right? So yeah, I I agree. How do, how do we continue to do that? And, and and you know we're gonna we're gonna always focus on that because the cost of losing great people is huge. Once you have somebody that's a fit for your culture, boy, you don't want to lose them. And and, and uh, we strive to do that every day as well as uh, you did too. Yeah, turnover is a killer. That's why you know when. We learned all sorts of things actually about our business when we went through the process of of selling it. Um, but because some of the data we really hadn't looked at that closely. Um, but you know the cost of um, replacing people, mm-hmm. uh, how you know how impressed potential buyers were at how low our turnover was, and. Why is it your culture? Do you mm-hmm. overpay your people? What you know, you get all sorts yeah, of questions. Some yeah. of them are pretty yeah. silly because um, I think we were always market or a little bit above, mm-hmm. um, which which is fine. Uh, I think there's something to be said about paying people more uh, because it does not cost you more at the end very often. So you know that was that was our philosophy too. But that turnover, as you said, is is key. Um, you know, that's why uh, I think, you know, when you take care of your people the way we did and you invest in them, I think that's really the most important thing. And those millennials always talk about, mm-hmm. well, how do I get better? Is the company going to invest in me? Those are legitimate questions. Yes, yes. And we did early on, you know, with a lot of training that cost us millions and millions, but people saw it. If they didn't, we reminded them every year at review time, mm-hmm. hey, you know, this is what we've invested in you. How do you feel? What else do you think that's, we can that, do? And that's a great point. That communication, when you're investing in your team, to, to let them know that this was a cost to invest in that degree that you got while you're working here and, yeah. and so on. Um, and, I, and I'll tell you, I, I, I believe in this millennial generation. I think the Y generation is even is also, also very strong. And when I say this, I believe if you provide the right the right culture that mm-hmm. they love being a part of, they're not looking for the next dollar. They're, they they want to be in a, 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 a place that... Where there, there's a why, why you know, why am I here? What's the reason? Well, if, right. you, if your business is, is is philanthropic and does cool things to give back to the communities they serve, if if your if your relationship oriented and you and you really you feel it's, it feels like a family atmosphere, mm-hmm. I believe the millennials and the Y generation are going to reward you with more longevity than our past generations, in my opinion. Right. Right. I just I, I feel that anyway, and, I, and we're we're finding this out in the last. You know, seven eight years because uh, we're because we're 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 loaded up with millennials and we continue to hire more. And, and I tell you what, as long as you create the the, the right culture, and I, and I think we've we've got it, and we're we're proud to say we've got it. You know, we've got amazing team members here today because of it. So, I think I think you just got to figure out what's what you know what's the why? Why do they want you know why do they want to be in your company right. instead of somebody else's? Uh, no, that's true. Well, I mean, you know, I used to have twenty two hundred employees, actually thirty five hundred at Robinson. Wow. I, I don't have. I don't have one today. <laughs> I was about to ask you. <laughs> Unlike you, I don't have any employees. Well, let's talk about this. You're, you're, you're doing cool stuff. I mean, I it, want it, to get into that. There's man. a couple of cool things you got to yeah. get into. <laughs> Number one, you're building a beautiful building uh, that I, I saw some pictures of. And I said, man, I, I, if I want to be able to afford to buy a condo in that building someday, and said, you'll, you'll never be able to afford it, Raybine, because we're not selling any condos. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> right. Those are luxury <laughs> you, apartments. You could do an apartment, right. maybe, but again, I mean, I'm, I'm, pu- I'm my, putting a penthouse aside for you. Is that right? Yeah. Oh my gosh! You yeah. saw my budget too, right? Yeah, it's forty-five hundred bucks a month. It's not, not a big deal for you. <laughs> it's a beautiful building. It's going to be you. awesome. It's going to be a really you. cool building. Yeah, we're going to have the top off party actually in a couple of days. I can't wait! I can't yeah. wait. Twenty-fifth floor. That was wow. the last floor. So awesome. And, and where is this building? Good. Seven thirty North Milwaukee in uh, River West. Okay. So that's really, 
you know, it's the Ogden exit yep. off of 90. It's mm -hmm. Milwaukee, Chicago, and Ogden. Mm -hmm. And uh, across the street, there's a building called Spoke. So, but we're about eight floors uh, taller than they are. And uh, they're a lot wider and they're a lot bigger. They have about 400 apartments. We only have 200, which is plenty for us. But um, so, you know, there's this little cluster that of three, four buildings that will get built right there in River West. Um, but it's funny. It feels like you can see our building from all angles. Yeah. It's great. Uh, you know, from the Ohio ramp, from Ogden, from the highway, from... So we're, we're excited. We, we have a great team. Uh, you know, a, a great uh, GC and great developer is, that I've known for a long time. Are you going to do more of these developments or just, you're just do So this is the second one. Second one now. Yeah, okay. the first one was uh, 2501 West Armitage, which has been fully leased for a couple of years. That was 85, 85 units. Okay. This, uh, now I was one of uh, several uh, investors in that building. This one here is, is my building, the one in, oh. in, uh, on Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. I went at it alone. A little crazy. And uh, yeah, we have plans for two more on Van Buren. They'll each be about 200 uh, units. We'll be seeking um, you know, investors uh, for, for, these, for these two buildings. They'll be beautiful. Once you prove you know what the heck you're doing anyway. Right. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, you know, right. the building is still standing. <laughs> it's not like the Tower of Pisa. Yeah. So um, now Tandem builds beautiful stuff. I've known them since about oh, 2006. Yeah. Good company. And uh, yeah, so, you know, I think of you every time I see them pouring that cement. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, where's Gary? Any, ex any exterior stuff, I want it, man. Exterior asphalt or concrete. But so you got the building, yeah. and then you also, I hear that you have a lot of passion about collecting and restoring European cars. You know, with an accent like this, you got to have. I'm just saying. You just got to have a, a, a couple cool cars. A couple? Uh, one, two, three, ten, whatever. Fifteen, sixteen. Tell, tell us about Eight, your. Eighty. Tell about your. your your passion. No, <laughs> no. I'm not. I'm not Richard Driehaus. Tell me about your passion um, for cars, and and yeah. I, and we we've been. You know, Cheryl and I have been blessed to be invited a couple of times to your to your this this uh, amazing garage of yours for 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 dinner. It's amazing. Go ahead, you go. know that? Yeah, that's that's why. What an experience it is. Yeah, that's why I built that place. It's really for that. It's you know to have you there and Ray <laughs> and my friends and watch the Super Bowl or you know have board meetings, uh, have drinks. And look over cars that I've collected since uh, probably about 2013 or something, 2012. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, you know, a lot of British stuff, old Jags, Astons, um, some Ferraris, Mercedes. What's your favorite? I have a 1959 DB24 mm. uh, Aston Martin that's <laughs> pretty sweet. I did the Colorado Grand within a few months ago. Oh, okay. And that's about 1,100 miles in five days. <laughs> And the car made it. <laughs> so, uh, but it, you know, it's a conversation piece, and I love those cars. I, I've, uh, you know, I drive them all, and uh, I make sure they're all in in great shape. So, hopefully, they enjoy being in that place because I take good care of them. And so, but, so uh, like, so like, uh, Ray's got the players' lounge behind his garage, Mahal. Yeah. All right. Oh, Stefan, yeah. Stefan's got an amazing lounge. Would that be the driver's lounge? What do you call that? I mean, a beautiful fireplace. Well, one, I mean, yeah, kitchen. One of, one of my friend called it one day the car gallery, and it kind of stuck. You know, that's okay. what. Yeah, car that's gallery. what we call it. Okay. But you know, Ray just wanted to one up me, and he, <laughs> and he did very successfully. His guitar place is unbelievable. If you like cars, though. so I haven't been invited. Yeah, uh, you yeah. can't drive those guitars though. No, you can't drive. Them. <laughs> That's the problem. I don't think you'd even let me play one, actually. You know. Well, you know what? You guys have an invite. Oh, an that's invite all anytime, I needed to hear. Anytime. Oh man, that's a blessing. Yeah, the weather. You know, the minute there is no more salt on the street, boom. There Let's we go. go. Yep. Nah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, that's all. That's all it takes. Yeah, this place is cool. And uh, thank you. You know, what, what's your plan? What do you want to do with, uh, with that space in the long run? Just, you know, the same. I mean, what's good is that it uh, forces me to be disciplined. Mm -hmm. I can't have more than 16 cars in there, so I don't. <laughs> if I want to buy another one, I have to sell one. Oh, okay. And uh, I refuse to continue to to buy cars and, and stick them yeah. here and there. Yeah, you know, yeah, I don't yeah. want to do that anymore. Yeah, these are all beautiful, but they're all drivers. Um, yeah, they're all drivers. And, you know, a couple would be uh, concours d'élégance type cars. You know, What would you just say? Uh, concours d'élégance? Yeah. That's, uh, that's a car show. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, 
Uh, yeah, there are lots of Concours d'Elegance around. Uh, but uh, see, I, just the way you say I it. can't stand guys like this, you know, you know Q? I mean, <laughs> girls just want to sit, sit around and listen to this guy talk, right? I mean, <laughs> what do we got? See, I, like I said, I, I tried I tried um, French, and I did it in high school, and I forgot it. After well, the, well, you, after you can say bonjour. I can say bonjour, je m'appelle, Quentin. Yeah. yeah okay, well, that's it. Q, Q, What Q, else do you, you need? You got a little of that, man. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Hey, that, I, you, petite, I you think you're ahead of Gary there. You got me excited. I can't say that. I'm not even gonna try. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can barely speak the only language I, <laughs> language I know. <laughs> but hey, uh, you know what? Uh, when when, uh, when you know when I think of this, though, this this garage and things you could do, it'll be so fun, right? You know, I know you want to do some fundraisers once in a while down yep. there and stuff. You could do so many cool things for the community and, yeah. and stuff. It's gonna be a blast to watch that happen. Yeah, and I and I do. I haven't really done anything yet there uh, for fundraisers, but you know, I work with St. Ignatius, where my kids went to school, mm -hmm. and uh, the Catholic Church and all that. So I think the day will come when you know I host events there for that purpose. Sure. So that's uh, awesome. You know, that's um, gonna be exciting. You know, one, one thing I always believed, and my dad kind of taught me, my dad was always a cat, is still always a cash guy, doesn't have debt on anything. He, mm -hmm. you know, he tries to buy everything with cash, doesn't, he's very patient, doesn't buy anything unless he can pay for it. And so I learned a little of that, not a lot, or I couldn't, you know, couldn't have grown and been as aggressive as I am in business. I take on debt and then I pay it down and, and all that. But yeah. personally, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was always taught don't own a fancy car or buy a fancy car or, or pickup truck or whatever unless you can pay cash for it. You know, mm -hmm. unless it's something you're making money with, you know, why are you financing it, right? And so I, I, I bought my first, for, you know, first nice car and, and uh, I was probably 30, 30 years old or so. And uh, when I could pay cash for a new Corvette. And uh, and it was nice. just exciting as can be, right? Oh, Sounds yeah. like you kind of took that to a crazy, crazy level because it doesn't sound like you had any car collections or anything until you sold your business. Right. And then you went kind of crazy, which is I'm, cool. I'm like you. You know what? It's, bad, it's a bad investment I, otherwise, yeah, right? Yeah, if I can't pay cash for it, I don't buy it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just I've never, you know, I've never believed in, in credit except, you know, of course, with our business. You know, we had business. a line of credit. And, you know, I think at the most we, we borrowed about, I think Chase, you know, Chase was always our bank, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, our line of credit went as high as thirty million bucks. We used all thirty at yep. times yep. Uh, when business was going extremely well, typically. But um, you know, by the time we sold the business, we actually had about sixty million bucks in the bank, which was kind of silly. Um, mm -hmm. But once again, you know, we probably could have bought other companies. Yep. Uh, I think what, what's interesting is. You know, we went from zero to a billion organically. That's why it took 30 years. Yeah. Okay. 30 year overnight I'm, success. I'm, I'm sure somebody who's listening would say, well, you guys are just a bunch of complete idiots. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, uh, we were just uh, international uh, shippers. That's what, that. you know, that's what we did, right? Yeah. Uh, we're not the most savvy financiers, but um, you know, if we did that again today, uh, we'd probably Leverage you know, more, maybe. Leverage more, uh, buy some of our smaller competitors, and we could have done what we did maybe in half the time mm -hmm. or even less. But, you know, we never built a business to sell it. Right. We, we wanted this to be the best place for our people and, you know, the best shipping company for our customers. I mean, that was very, you know, naive and, and, and yeah. you know, passionate, and that's what we wanted to do. I mean, we just, you know, selling it was not the goal. Well, and I think every business we build, we should be building it uh, to, to create value. So it should mm -hmm. be looked upon as something that anybody would want to buy, right? But yet, but you know, I'm, I'm very, very similar. I don't build any business to sell. Um, we build them all to create value right. and, and, and to create opportunities and value for the team members on board. But you mm -hmm. know, the, but they better be valuable on the outside to buy. Otherwise, they're really not that valuable. If every business relies on me to, right. to, to operate it, to be involved day to day, Sorry, there's just not a lot of value there, right? Mm -hmm. I get hit by a, a bus tomorrow and there's no value. Right. Um, compared to building business with great, great leaders that can that can lead with or without you, or you know, creating systems of duplication right. that can that can go on beyond you. That's value, right? Right. So I mean, for I think I think for us to think, you know, like you did is is the most valuable way to think. Build this business to where it's going to benefit us and our customers, serve our serve the problems that we find in the industries and mm -hmm. solve our customers' problems, and and you're going to create value. You, you know, build it to sell it. Uh, I don't. I, I don't. I mean, I know a lot of people do that. I don't think it's the best, you know, way to, way to think. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, when when the second partner uh, eventually retired, and I I became the second partner uh, out of three, and we brought in Andy and and uh, you know my my equity in the business, 
increased and I became CEO and president and, and, and CEO eventually. That was, you know, that was the narrative I shared with, with our people. You know, mm -hmm. let's continue to, to, to do the best we can to really enjoy working here. That's really important. Mm -hmm. and, and to continue to build a great business. And, and I think, you know, anybody could come in my office at any time. You know, I had great relationships because I had been so long. You know, a lot of us grew together mm -hmm. in that company too, which was yeah, really yeah. a lot of fun because, you know, I was 48 when we sold the business. And, you know, a lot of my, the, the members of my management team, you know, were right around the same age. Nice. You'd be friends and for life yeah. with many of them, right? Yeah, yeah, still are, of yeah. course. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm involved in a little business with Ray and, mm -hmm. and my partner in that is Emil, who was my CFO. Uh, and CEO at Phoenix right. for yeah for 30 years, so yeah those relationships will last forever. Man, That's awesome. Net worth equals That's your net worth. That's a true statement, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. When, again, it's all about trust, right, Q? I mean, yeah. and when you have people you trust that you know you'd go to battle with at anything you do, right? Boy, it's nice to be able to go back to them and say, "Hey, man, you ready again? Yeah. I got another Let's battle for you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this one, right? Let's do I it. Mean, <laughs> you know, whether it's your whether it's your team members, right? Your 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 counterparts as leaders, your customers, your vendors, all those, all you know, all those relationships you build. Yeah. You know, you hate to see them go by the wayside, right? If you can mm -hmm. do fun things together in the future, why not? Right. Mm -hmm. So I tell you what, I, I you know, I, I am uh, I'm, I'm confident there's going to be a lot of a lot of lessons learned, Q. And I know you wrote down some of them here. Our, our audience is going to be, uh, be be their, their hunger is going to be fed with our buddy Stefan. Man, I'm, <laughs> oh, and they you. probably need to re-listen to this every single time. I have some amazing takeaways for you guys. This this Quentin's true takeaways. These golden nuggets over here by Stefan was amazing. One uh, for all of our startups out, out there, you know, watch your experience expenses as a startup um, is extremely important. But I think one thing you alluded to, um, it's really all about focus and staying in your lane. Do more of what you're great at. And it's extremely key, especially, you know, as you're starting a business or as you have a business. And I'm starting to even see that with Gary. Um, one thing you say, which I thought was pretty key, you know, hire for attitude, train for skill, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, hire slowly, fire swiftly. I think that's um, <clears throat> as we're in a the type of life that we're in now, I think it makes a lot of sense. As you're growing a business, you want the right team, and the, and, um, and and that's extremely important. Uh, but the one thing it, it shows why you have the success in my mind is the mindset that you have when specific when you said, when you take the chance, the worst thing that can happen is to fail. You know, if you think like that, like, hey, what's the worst thing that can happen mm -hmm. right now? Honestly, well, just start back at zero and I can go again. Mm -hmm. And like you said, that's America. You know, and um, take care of your people and invest in them often. But the best takeaway is the fact that Quentin James has an invite <laughs> to see his garage. <laughs> that right there. I agree. Let it all. Again, <laughs> listen to this you podcast. Don't know, you, don't you don't know the you door. You don't know the door. You do not know up. the door. You have opened, my friend. I'm just letting you know. Hey, and hey. I appreciate it. Ma, Dad, uh, hey, come here and check this out. Hey, cousin, cousin Louie, Louie, come here. You got to check I ain't gotta, this out. I don't hey, have a cousin Louie, hey, but uh, I got a cousin Lee. Hey, probably, Lee, hey, Lee, know? check out this. Dad. Come here. Let, jump in the Jesse Martin with me. Let's take it for a ride. Hey, Stefan, we're back, man. There we go. No, um, hey, April's around the corner. Hey, I'm looking for uh, uh, a mm -hmm. Merci, Stefan. Merci. Stefan, you're awesome, buddy. We really, really appreciate you. you being here. And, uh, and well, thanks and, for having me. It's and great. Congratulations, and, and Thank keep you. it going, buddy. You're a young man. You're a young man, and you got a lot of, a lot of road ahead of you. So uh, I Thank can't you. wait to see what's next for you, buddy. And I want to, I want to be uh, part of this network to watch your, you know, watch you kick ass in the future. Well, you want to be in that penthouse. That's what you. Oh, mean, that right? too. That too. Well, okay. for forty five hundred bucks, man, I'm not sure I can <laughs> swing that though. Gee, I'm going to be looking for a deal. And we'll see you all next time on Ditch Digger CEO. See ya.